Hey, good morning, church. Today, we finally get to meet Ezra. Isn't it a little bit strange that we're more than halfway through this book and we haven't actually met the guy after which the book is named? Uh, and in fact, even time-wise, it's a little strange. So you might remember that this story starts in about the year 539 BC and uh, Zerubbabel is the leader at the time. He leads the first wave of exiles back to Jerusalem, takes about 50,000 people with him and they start rebuilding the temple. They give it about two years and then they take a bit of a gap year or 15 and it takes Haggai the prophet who comes back and gives them a little bit of a nudge to carry on working. It's a bit of a euphemism if you remember that sermon about Haggai. He gets them started again on work on the temple. Uh, it's another four years of working and then they finished the temple and it's this massive celebration and that's where we ended off last week chapter 6 this amazing celebration of the dedication of the temple and so then you turn over the page chapter 7 and uh, it says this in verse 1 now after this after this big celebration and then it goes into us meeting Ezra and here's what's really funny about that when it says now, after this, like as in after the celebration, the gap between the celebration and meaning Ezra or the gap between chapter six and chapter seven is 57 years, 57 years between chapter six and chapter seven, which is funny when it says now after this, like it was now 57 years after this. It's kind of like uh, my wife, Kristen, still can't get her head around uh, the, the, how I use or how I think we as South Africans use the phrase the other day. You know, just the other day could mean like yesterday or it could mean two years ago or like just the other day when I was 10 years old. You know, it's like this massive phrase. And here it is again, like now after this 57 years later, we finally meet Ezra. And now Ezra, the book Ezra, doesn't tell us much about what happened in that 57-year gap. We know by what Ezra is going to do that there was like massive spiritual decline in those years. But historically, there's nothing recorded in Ezra about what happened in that gap. Of course, we do know that a lot was happening in the greater story of the people of God. Because in those 57 years, the story of Esther is taking place, right? And you might remember that story, the story of how Esther uh, courageously, bravely intervenes on behalf of God's people that were remaining back in Babylon. Remember, most of the people stayed back in Babylon, and there was this threat to their very existence. They were almost wiped out. And Esther stands up bravely and courageously, which leads to kind of the salvation of all the Jews remaining in Babylon. This sort of was really important to mention that on Women's Day. Just a shout out to women who bravely, courageously, and with immense faith intervene daily uh, in, in upholding the kingdom of God in their world. So that story takes place. And so when you read Ezra 7 verse 1, and it says, Now after this, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, if you know the story of Esther, you know, hey, Artaxerxes, king of Persia, that's Esther's stepson. How cool is that? Remember Esther became queen? So Artaxerxes is now Esther's stepson, which is maybe why Ezra has so much favor with this particular king. We get ahead of ourselves a little bit. So are you ready to finally meet the person Ezra? Well, if so, then let's read. Ezra 7, I'm going to read from verse 1 to 10. Now after this, 57 years later, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra 
the son of Sariah, son of Azariah, son of Hilkiah, son of Shalem, son of Zadok, son of Ahitab, son of Amariah, son of Azariah, son of Merioth, son of Zariah, son of Uzai, son of Bukai, son of Abishua, son of Phinehas, son of Eleazar, son of Aerith, Aaron, the chief priest, this Ezra, went up from Babylonia. Should have practiced that a little bit more. He was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. And the king granted him, granted Ezra, all that he asked. For the hand of the Lord, his God, was on him. And there went up also to Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king, some of the people of Israel and some of the priests and Levites, the singers and gatekeepers and the temple servants. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For on the first day of the first month, he began to go up from Babylonia. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem. So a journey of four months for the good hand of his God was on him. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. So already that's a little glimpse into Ezra. He sounds like a good guy, doesn't he? Absolutely. Following from that is, a, is the letter that Artaxerxes gives to Ezra for his journey. And it's a letter giving Ezra immense authority as a representative of the king. And it's also a letter that describes immense provision. I just want to encourage you to go read Artaxerxes' letter that he sends with Ezra and all the promises that he makes about how he, a Persian king, will contribute towards beautifying the temple in Jerusalem. If you had to translate those amounts to kind of modern day, it will work out to something like 20 million rand Artaxerxes gives to Ezra to kind of just, you know, make the temple a little bit better. Like there's a lot we could do with 20 million rand, right? He offers him gold and silver from his own treasury. He says, hey, by the way, just go around the land. If you find any silver and gold, just feel free to take that with you as well. When you get there, if there's not enough, you just, you just give me a call. I'll just, it gives him a blank check for whatever Ezra needs to reinstitute worship and make the temple amazing. Artaxerxes says, I've got you covered. I mean, it's crazy. If you read that letter, the spectacular provision of the Lord. In fact, some scholars say, man, that's just too much. There's no way this is true. And they think that this letter was falsified because it's that incredible. And this is not something new to us in the story of Ezra, isn't it? It's this theme that's developed from the very beginning. The peculiar yet extraordinary provision of God for his people. Cyrus also did the same thing. Darius, you remember, also contributed to the temple and now Artaxerxes as well. God will always fund his work and look after his people. I just feel like that's probably a good reminder for a lot of you, especially in these times, the peculiar providence of God. We're seeing it again. And then the letter ends... Uh, or the last few verses of chapter 7, is now Ezra himself speaking in the first person. And these last two verses is a great summary of what the whole chapter is about. So verse 27 and 28 says this, Blessed be the Lord, the God of our fathers, who put such a thing as this into the heart of the king, to beautify the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem, and who extended to me his steadfast love before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty officers. So I took courage. for The hand of the Lord my God was on me. And I gathered leading men from Israel to go up with me. Clearly, this is one 
special guy. Three times, I don't know if you picked it up, three times this phrase comes up, for the hand of the Lord God was with Ezra. It's a special guy. I mean, rabbis, Jewish rabbis today would even consider Ezra second only to Moses. Right? They would say that if Moses had not received the law, Ezra would have. And not without reason. It's an incredible Bible character. And so what I want to do today is just do a bit of a character sketch of Ezra, a bit of a biography. There's clearly a lot to learn from him. And hey, I love biographies. That's my favorite genre of books to read. But before we get to this character sketch, to talking about how incredible this guy Ezra was, we need to lay a little foundation here. See, because here's what happens sometimes when we come across these immense Bible characters and dig into their stories. It's very easy to kind of go through all of these characters and and see their greatness and go, man, be like Moses, be like David, be like Daniel, be like Esther, be like Ezra. It's kind of like the weight of all of these characters and how amazing they were. There's a there's a couple of problems with this approach of just looking at their characters and marveling at how great they were. First problem is that it can just be overwhelming. So we love some of the Bible characters that at least show us a bit of their flaws. Like David, as amazing as he was, we we love that story because we know he had some obvious flaws. In the New Testament, we love to talk about Peter. He was on the rock on which the church was built, but he also had some very obvious flaws. And so we can identify with with Peter. But when it comes to these characters like this in this time period, Daniel, Esther, Ezra. I mean, all that we know about them is that they were perfect. I mean, obviously weren't, but we don't know anything negative about these guys. And so it can just be overwhelming. You just like start making lists of all these amazing, amazing Bible characters and what they were like. You end up with this massive long list of this is what I must be like. And it's honestly can be quite exhausting. That's the first problem when we do these kind of character sketches. It, It can be overwhelming. And the second problem is that it's also a bit of a trap. It can be a bit of a trap. Because the truth is there is only one person that we are supposed to revere and model ourselves after, and that person is Jesus. And we've always got to remember this when doing character studies in the Bible. I mean, absolutely, we're going to learn from these men and women, but there's a difference between learning from them and modeling our lives after them or wanting to be like them. We do not ultimately aspire to be like Ezra. I mean, firstly, because he was imperfect, we just don't see those imperfections. But secondly, and most importantly, somehow all these great Bible characters All of them actually point to Jesus. Because Jesus will exemplify everything that's good about them. And he will be the ultimate ultimate fulfillment of all that they were supposed to be. So this is really important. I want to just spend a bit of time on this this morning. So Tim Keller has been so helpful on this subject. So he preached a sermon that has been turned into all sorts of videos uh, where he talks about Jesus is the true and better 
And then he lists like these Bible characters. He says, Jesus is the true and better Abel. Jesus is the true and better Abraham. Jesus is the true and better Isaac. He's the true and better Jacob. And you can just go Google Tim Keller, Jesus is true and better, and you'll come up with all these amazing videos. And what he's saying is that as amazing as they were, everything good about them was fulfilled only in Jesus. So for example, Isaac who Abraham offered up as a sacrifice, but ultimately did not sacrifice. Jesus was ultimately sacrificed. He's the true and better Abraham and true and better Isaac, the true and better Moses. He's the true and better David. He's the true and better Esther. Jesus is the true and better Ezra. And that's not in Tim Keller's sermon, by the way, but he is the true and better Ezra, because everything good about Ezra, all of his brilliance that we're going to see, points towards and is fulfilled in Jesus. Let me give you a quick example of that. So I read that long list of the genealogy of Ezra. I mean, why is that there? It's there to show us that he comes from the line of priests. He comes straight from Aaron. We see that. I mean, if ever you needed great credentials, Ezra had great credentials. Not only was he a direct descendant of Aaron, as all priests had to be, but he comes from the line of Zadok. Zadok was the high priest at the time of David and Solomon. So Ezra comes as this priestly figure. And remember, Jesus ultimately would become the great high priest who would once and for all intercede on behalf of man. We would never need a priest again after Jesus. He is the true and better Ezra. All that to say, all these amazing Bible characters, as brilliant as they are, some of them, They all point to Jesus as the ultimate object of our worship. That kind of makes sense this morning. I mean, otherwise we'd look at Ezra and go, wow, he's amazing. And it could lead to some cult of Ezraites. I do not know if such a thing exists, but it could. That's how great he seems to be. But of course, Jesus is going to be the ultimate object of our worship. Now, here's the really good news about this. Jesus, the true and better Ezra. The really good news is that, you know, as we look to Jesus through these characters, and as we fix our eyes on him, we actually have a shot at starting to exhibit some of these characteristics that we see in these characters and want to, and want to be like. But only as we look to Jesus Here's the thing. When we look at some of these characters, we look at Ezra today. A lot of what I'm going to pull out about how great Ezra was. Let me just heads up on this bit of an anticlimax. You're going to know everything. You're going to. It's, this is not going to be news to you. This is often what happens. We see these characters and we go, "Yeah, I know. I'm supposed to be like this, but I'm not." And I try, but I just don't seem to be able to be like them. Well, here's the good news. One would come after Ezra who would be perfect, who would exemplify and fulfill these things. And see, when you look to Jesus through Ezra, you actually have a chance of being changed. Ezra cannot change you. The example of Ezra cannot change you. It can give you something to strive towards and to live towards. But willpower on its own is not going to work. But Jesus, as we look to Jesus through Ezra, now there is a chance of actually achieving some of these things. Does that make sense? So now that we've laid this huge foundation, now we can look at Ezra. And I have four things that I want to pull out about Ezra. So number one, Ezra was a dedicated Bible student. 
And some of you know the story of Ezra, perhaps the most famous verse. You know it was coming to this. I love, I looked at you know, a couple of sermons on this chapter 7, and one guy just titled it so obviously. He said, this is a sermon about reading your Bible more. <laughs> that was the title of the sermon. Because, yeah, Ezra was a dedicated Bible student. So we read in verse 6. Listen to this again. This Ezra went up from Babylon, Babylonia. He was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses. So he had clearly dedicated himself to studying what was then the Bible and was very good at it. According to tradition, Ezra had memorized the first five books of the Bible, the Bible available to him at the time. He had memorized it. He, according, according to tradition, wrote Psalm 119, which is that longest psalm about delighting in the law. He wrote the book of Esther. He wrote First and Second Chronicles. And he was most likely the one to have kind of compiled the Old Testament into its current shape that we have today. This is a guy whose life was just based around studying the Word of God. So he was a dedicated Bible student. But number two, Ezra was also an effective Bible teacher. So not just a brilliant student, but a brilliant teacher. And you see this in Nehemiah chapter 8. So Ezra makes an appearance in Nehemiah chapter 8. It's about 15 years after this moment. And the walls of Jerusalem have now been rebuilt by Nehemiah. And Nehemiah, the governor of the time, assembles everybody uh, before the, the lion's gate in this great temple square. And he calls Ezra to come up and read to the people from the law of God. And they erect, you can read this in Nehemiah 8, this massive wooden pulpits, like the first appearance of a pulpit in the Bible. And Ezra stands with some helpers and he reads from and he preaches for an entire morning, sunrise to lunchtime. That's a long sermon. Just saying. And he reads from the law of the Lord. And if you go on and read just the result of that. So in verse 8 of chapter 8 says, Ezra read from the book, the law of God. He read clearly and gave the sense. It's not just reading, it's explaining. So that the people understood the reading. And this amazing things happen. It's like this revival just breaks out. So verse 12 of Nehemiah 8. And the people went their way after this long sermon. They went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing. Not because the sermon was finally over, but because they had understood the words that were declared to them which is pretty much my dream every Sunday, that when we read and speak, and as I and other preachers try to give the sense of the word, that people walk away rejoicing because they've understood it and God has spoken to them, and then they'll go away and eat lunch. How cool is that? Number three, Ezra was an obedient, not just dedicated student, not just great teacher, but an obedient Bible doer. So if you want to summarize the greatness of Ezra, then Ezra 7 verse 10 is a great summary of why he was so brilliant. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. Study it, taught it. And he did it too. have to give a quick shout out in the kids service. It was so great. If you want to remember that, S-O-S, -S, study, obey, and what was it? Sh share, teach. <laughs> study, obey, share. It's a great way to remember what Ezra, what made him so great. He didn't just know it, didn't just teach others to do it, but he lived it. Which is where it would be fitting for us to pause and make some application. Because Ezra 7 verse 10, description of Ezra, this is a worthwhile, it's worthwhile for us to try and replicate this. This is a transferable principle to us right now. We should set our hearts to, you know, as that pastor said, <laughs> study the word of God. The interesting thing about Ezra, so he's back in Babylon. 
He's grown up there. He's been born in Babylon. He's lived in Babylon all his life. And he's studying. He's developing his skills, studying God's words in Babylon. And you go, well, you know, what's so amazing about that? Well, you know, as we read about these kings in Ezra, the kings of Persia back you know, in Babylon, it seems like they're great guys. But the truth is, in Scripture, Babylon would always come to represent everything that's evil in secular culture. Right up to the book of Revelation, Babylon is not a great name that you would want to ascribe to a place that you live. It represents just moral decay. Secularism at its peak is exemplified in Babylon. Ezra's there setting himself to study the Word of God. In other words, it's not like the environment was conducive towards his studying God. It's not like everybody was doing it, and that was the cool thing to do. There wasn't even a temple where he could study it and have some job lined up, and that's why he studied it. It was in the midst of this decaying culture. Somehow there was a sense in Ezra that as I study this Word of God, God is going to use this to transform culture which is exactly what God does through Ezra. And for us today, it's perhaps exactly the same thing. There's nothing conducive about our culture that would make you naturally want to spend your time studying the Bible. You'll study everything else to get ahead and to accomplish and do well in life, but not really the Bible. And so perhaps this is a great example for us in the Babylon of our world to set our hearts to study and then to teach Yes, all of us. Yes, yeah, it doesn't mean teach formally only. Ezra did formally teach. But in fact, the word in verse 10 that says he teach is the word train. Train. Train has a lot more of a practical, more global sense to it. It's not just about a classroom and, and pulpits. When we talk about training others, we talk about our lives having this impact where we're modeling, correcting, encouraging, speaking, teaching, mentoring. And this takes place not just in pulpits and classrooms, but in homes, in communities, in workplaces, in social spaces. I mean, as I think about this, I think about parents, and I think about Deuteronomy 4 and 6, about knowing the word and teaching it to your children. And, and remember those words, and, and from the morning when you wake up to your going to sleep, to your coming out, to your going in, to your walking, these words are part of you. And these words are coming out of you, and you're living these words in a way that ends up teaching your children. I think about the commandment that all followers of Jesus will be disciple makers and will disciple others. And as we think about that, we realize that discipling others is not so much about lectures, but a kind of a life on life lived reality of the word of God being lived through us in a way that it is that understandable. People get it and they are transformed by it. It's just far bigger than just this that I'm doing now. Study, teach, meaning breathe and live out in a way that can be understood. And then lastly, to do. <laughs> that we know the word, that we teach it through our lives, but also rigorously obey there's so much you could say about this point. I could refer back to Jesus' parable of the house on the rock. I just want to point to James chapter 1, 22 to 25. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, then he's just like a man who looks intently at his own face in a mirror. What good is that? For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. That's what happens so often when you read the Bible. And you say, just read it, look at it. No, it's not looking good this morning. And walk away and forget everything that we just saw. But the one who looks into the perfect 
Word of God, this law of liberty, and perseveres. Be no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts. He will be blessed in his doing. It seems like that verse could have been uh, written for Ezra, the example of Ezra. Maybe that's why the hand of the Lord was on him. He who hears and does will be blessed in his doing. All that divine favor and all that God did through Ezra, perhaps. Lastly, Ezra was a passionate reformer. So he didn't just know the word and strive to live it out in his own life. He was desperate to see the word of God, the commands of God lived out in other people's lives, in the society around him. He was a reformer in the true sense of the word. Someone who desires to see society around them changed by a lived out obedience to God. That's what a reformer is. Ezra was a passionate reformer. It wasn't just about his own life. We have a little glimpse of this in chapter 7, uh, in verse 14, in Artaxerxes' letter. He kind of he lets Ezra go, and you wonder, you know, what prompted that? And it seems like Ezra had made inquiries. He had heard, hey, these people back in Jerusalem are not living according to the word of God. And so Artaxerxes says, well, go, help them. But you see it really clearly, this passion for reformation. In chapters 9 and 10. And I'm going to dwell on that a lot when we get to chapter 9 and 10. But I want to just give a quick glimpse of it here. Just the issue is he uncovers idolatry. And when Ezra sees the idolatry, his response is incredible. He doesn't go ballistic and yell at everybody. You read in the beginning of chapter 10, it's amazing. He breaks down and he mourns. He's literally grieving. Not at his sin, at what's happening around him. He grieves. He fasts for them. And he prays this prayer of repentance on behalf of them. Remember, it's not his sin. But is it in this moment of grieving, so passionate to see people's lives lived out in the ways of God. And instead of yelling at them, he just breaks down. And the amaz- an amazing thing happens. People start to like gather around. The first few verses of chapter 10. They start to just gather around. They see this, eh? and their hearts start to get moved. And they start to pray these prayers of repentance. It's this incredible scene at the beginning of chapter 10. I'm going to end our series looking at that moment. So much more that I can say and I will say a couple of weeks' time. But for now, I simply want to say this. See, later, after Ezra, would come one, like Ezra, but better, the perfect fulfillment of Ezra, who would also mourn over the sin of the people. Jesus, as he approaches Jerusalem, remember that? And he breaks down and he cries, oh Jerusalem, would that I've gathered you under my wings. And he's broke, he's grieving over the sinfulness and all that God had planned. Would that you know the salvation that God wants to work in your life. And he grieves He desires their transformation like Ezra does. But the difference is Jesus can effect the transformation. Ezra can't. So there's this little revival in chapter 10, and we'll celebrate that. But it doesn't last long. We get to Nehemiah, and Nehemiah has to do it all over again. And he goes a little bit crazy on the guys. We've actually looked at that a little bit before. He goes nuts. And ultimately, there's the sense of frustration. We desperately need change. We want change. But we do not have access to the kind of power that can change us. And that's where, I'll close with this, 
when we look to Jesus through Ezra. When we look to Jesus through Ezra. We don't bypass Ezra. We learn from his amazing example. But when we look to Jesus through Ezra, it's in Jesus, through looking at him and worshiping him and believing in him that we actually can experience transformation ourselves and see that transformation in the world around us. Is that what you want this morning? If so, then join with me as we pray. God, as we come before your word this morning and just reflect back to thousands of years ago, groups of people gathered to hear your word. I pray this morning that in at least some way, that as we've read these words together, and as I've tried to give the sense of it, that God, you would speak in a way that leads to understanding. And that as we look at this example of Ezra, God, we come before you and we say, yeah, we want to be people passionate about your word, about teaching it in the lives of our families, our communities, our workplaces, our social spaces. Ultimately, we would love to see transformation, reformation happen in the world around us. We know Jesus that that power is in your hands. And so we look to you, the great high priest, the perfect high priest, priest and king. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that now as you mediate your presence through your Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, would you start to bring that change in our lives? Would you start to light a fire or fan into flame this passion for your word? Open our eyes to see wonderful things and start to change our lives in accordance with what we read. And give us a boldness and a wisdom to speak these words in ways that are transformative to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.